Good afternoon, and welcome to the sixth and final week this year of the American Presidency, our series of conversations with noted historians and journalists about the people and events that have defined the most important elected office in the world. Our program is brought to you by the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library, the UT Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and Humanities Texas. I'm Phil Barnes, and it is my privilege to chair the UT Olive Sage Enrichment Committee. Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and himself a widely respected historian, is the host of our conversations. As a member of the audience, you may participate in the Q&A segment of our program by using the chat function to write and submit questions. And I would encourage you to do so. Our Q&A host today is my UT Olive colleague and our friend, Sandy Press. The theme for this year's series has been the American presidency, pivotal elections. I look back at six of our 59 presidential campaigns and elections deemed by many to be among the most consequential in our history. And all of this is a reminder that our 60th presidential election the election of 2024 will not be the only consequential election that our nation has experienced. Our guest today is John Ward, an experienced journalist with more than two decades writing about American politics and culture. He has served as the city desk reporter in Washington, D.C., as a White House correspondent traveling on Air Force One all over the world, and as a national affairs correspondent traveling the country to write about presidential campaigns. He is the author of Camelot's End, Kennedy versus Carter, which is the story of the 1980 battle of the Democratic nomination for president. James Earl Carter and Edward Moore Kennedy Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy were powerful Democratic politicians. Ambitious, driven, and highly competitive, they fought a bitter battle for the Democratic Party nomination in 1980. In his widely acclaimed book, John Ward gives us thorough insight into the campaign and the men involved. Carter and Kennedy could hardly have been more different. A man from the South, Carter was born into poverty in his early years, living in a house without running water. Ted Kennedy, a man from the North, was born into a wealthy, prominent family of international acclaim and privilege. Carter lifted himself up, attending the U.S. Naval Academy and could have had a career in the Navy, but chose instead to return to Georgia. Ted Kennedy, by contrast, virtually inherited the Senate seat left by his brother John when JFK was elected president. And his family name and the power of the Kennedy political machine really shielded Ted Kennedy from the consequences of his own careless, carousing, and crisis-filled life. As John Ward tells the story, by the time in 1974, when three-term U.S. Senator Kennedy met with little-known one-term governor of Georgia, Kennedy had little reason to know or even suspect that Carter was already planning a careful and thorough campaign for his party's nomination in 1976. Kennedy, as John discloses, chose not to run that year. Carter won the nomination and defeated Gerald Ford in the general election. But all along, Carter, like the rest of the political world, really believed Kennedy would eventually be compelled to run for president, seeking to return the glory of Camelot 
and he did so in 1980, arrogantly challenging the incumbent president of his own party. So to learn, learn more about this fascinating campaign and pivotal election, we welcome for today's interview, John Ward, the author of Camelot's End, Kennedy versus Carter, and the fight that broke the Democratic Party. And now, to Mark Lawrence. Well, thank you so much, Phil, and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here with, for this sixth and sadly uh, final program in this year's series. And thanks especially to our special guest, John Ward. John, it's wonderful to have you. Mark, thanks for having me. And Phil, thanks for that introduction. Uh, you got my juices flowing and ready to talk. <laughs> John, you, you, you've written so eloquently about the, the 1980 race, um, uh, but in an unusual way. You know, your, your book isn't um, focused on the man who generally stands out as the star of that particular show, Ronald Reagan. Uh, you've given us a book that deals with this fascinating battle within the Democratic Party between Ted Kennedy and Jimmy Carter, precisely as Phil has just uh, mentioned. And we want to get you know deeply into these two characters and maybe pull Ronald Reagan into this uh, as as well at a certain point. But set the stage for us to get us going. It's a, it's almost a cliche, it seems to me, to say that the 1980 election was a pivotal election in in American history. In in what ways? Was it a breaking point in American political history? Yeah, uh, I'm a child of the 70s. I was born there, and um, Ronald Reagan was a big part of my childhood. Um, my dad, as I've written about in my other book, which was about growing up evangelical, my father uh, was raised Catholic, voted for McGovern, uh, voted for Carter in 76, and then voted for Reagan in 80. Um, and that was the household I, I was raised in. Um, and you're right. This story, this chapter uh, was was generally neglected, um, especially by Democrats, in part because it's so painful. It was so painful um, because it was a shattering of a number of things. It was a shattering of sort of um, the party unity. It was a shattering of sort of the last gasp of the three Kennedy brothers and their attempts to run or to return to the presidency, Bobby being struck down in 69. Uh, and then Teddy, uh, you know, at some point being obligated to kind of pick up the torch of his two older brothers, both of them slain. And then finally, it was a, it was a shattering of the, the democratic coalition. And this is where your question really takes us because um, a lot of what we're seeing in American politics today, in terms of the Democratic Party's problems with working class Americans, traces its roots to this part of our history. Donald Trump's appeal to the Rust Belt, um, in a large part, traces its roots to this part of our history. Um, a couple stats I looked up earlier today, I mean, the South had been voting Democratic in presidential elections uh, forever, mm. before the Civil War. Um, that changed in 64, 1964, after the civil rights legislation was passed. Um, in 64 and 72, it went Republican. In 68, the South went for George Wallace. So those three elections between civil rights and Jimmy Carter all went against the Democrats. Jimmy Carter a Democrat won the South back and no Democrat has done that since. Not even Bill Clinton. Clinton got part of the South, but not all of it. Um, the other thing to keep in mind in terms of the Democratic coalition, because that's what I'm talking about mm -hmm. when I talk about the South, is organized labor. Uh, you know, Organized labor really gained a lot of strength um, out of the New Deal, which is where the Democratic coalition really gained strength under FDR. Um, and by the 60s, into the 60s, about a third of American, the American workforce was unionized. By the time Ronald Reagan leaves office in 1988, eight years after this part of our history that I'm writing about in this book, mm -hmm. about that, that number had been cut in half almost to about 17%. And a lot of this is written about in David Leonhardt's new book, mm -hmm. 
was an excellent look at this question. So, you know, the decline of organized labor was really a bit a part of an even larger story of the democratic coalition declining because it it was just a, a major sign of their uh, connection to the working class mm -hmm. being being severed and weakened and broken. Um, and Carter's presidency contributed to that. He did not uh, get some key legislation passed that would have helped organize labor. Um, I didn't know this, but Leon Hart's book talks about how uh, Paul Volcker's uh, 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 approach to taming inflation uh, was more uh, helpful to Wall Street than it was to Main Street. And that, you know, that trend continued a lot under Clinton as well with the push for China to get into the World Trade Organization. So 80 was really the moment where the FDR coalition started to really mm -hmm. founder on the rocks. But I could not agree more that David Lanhart's new book about the the, the history of the American dream is a, a fascinating book. Uh, book that really lines up very well with uh, many of the things that you write about. So much in that answer that you just gave to my very first question, I, you know, obviously I want to unpack a lot of what you were just talking about as, as we proceed here, but maybe let's let's um, dial it back to a, a more granular level and talk about the fascinating cast of characters in your book, particularly, of course, Carter and Kennedy, uh, the two the two stars of, of the show. I mean, let's start, I would suggest, with Jimmy Carter, who, of course, had been elected president in in 1976. Remind us of the source of his appeal in 1976 and where he stood within his party uh, as, as his presidency advanced. Carter's appeal was very much tied to the uh, lack of appeal of Richard Nixon. Uh, Watergate uh, and the, the impeachment or the um, resignation of, um, of Richard Nixon, sorry, he was not impeached, but the resignation of uh, Richard Nixon after the Watergate scandal, um, that was weighing heavily on the American uh, psyche, as was the, the Vietnam War um, and a feeling of betrayal um, by the government in taking us into a conflict where we lost so many American, young American lives. Um, so those two things were really uh, a burden on the American uh, populace. You also had energy crises in the early 70s before you get to the gas lines uh, of 1979. You have a, a gas shortage in, I believe, 73. Um, there's a lot of anxiety in the country about our standing on the world stage. Um, and so Jimmy Carter came along. Um, and in addition to appealing to the Democrats uh, for his ability to win back the South, more generally, he was uh, somebody who could um, renew a sense of hope renew a sense of optimism, um, and renew a sense of moral uh, purpose, I think. Um, you know, he talked about faith a lot. He was a um, born-again Christian, um, which that was a very, you know, that that's part of my story. You know, my, my parents became born-again Christians in the 70s, um, and that had a lot of appeal to a lot of young people. So, Carter talked to his uh, to the voters that he would see, you know, on the campaign on the campaign trail um, about wanting to have a government as good as its people. Mm. Uh, and, you know, there are echoes of that in George Bush's campaign in 2000, where he talks about trying to restore dignity to the office after um, Bill Clinton's uh, scandal with Monica Lewinsky. Um, but Carter was the one who, who kind of um, mm. pioneered that message. Hmm. So now let's let's move forward into let's say 1978, 1979. Jimmy Carter's been in office a few years. The story I think that we know relatively well is why Jimmy Carter was vulnerable to Ronald Reagan and to the surging conservative movement. What you do such a great job of calling our attention to is why he was vulnerable to someone with Ted Kennedy's politics. So tell us why there was that opportunity for Ted Kennedy to get into the race and to uh, you know, do some serious damage to um, Jimmy Carter's re-election prospects. Yeah, the fall of 79, the summer and fall, maybe even starting in the spring, uh, is a fascinating chapter uh, because it was pretty shocking to me when I first discovered this, that in the fall of 79, polling showed Ted Kennedy was up two to one mm. on Jimmy Carter um, in terms of who would be the, the nominee of the party in the 1980 election. 
that was due to a couple things, um, namely inflation and energy shortages. Um, inflation was in the double digits, mm -hmm. and we can you know relate to that now because we've had uh, very high inflation um, over the last few years. That's come down now, but is still sort of you know lingering. Um, and it was really hurting the ability of the middle class to make uh, major purchases of you know automobiles. Of, uh, of a first home or a second home. Um, and so that was inflation, price pressure. And then uh, the summer of 79, things really fell apart when it came to energy. Um, and one of the most famous chapters in Carter's presidency is what's known as the malaise speech, which happened uh, in July of 79. Carter was traveling abroad uh, in Asia. He had planned to uh, kind of stop over in Hawaii for a night or two to kind of recover uh, from jet lag. And his aides back in Washington were sending, uh, you know, panicked messages about the escalating uh, chaos at gas stations around the country. There was violence. People were being stabbed and shot. People died at some of these gas stations. Hmm. Uh, people were, you know, rationing gas. They had to pick a certain day to go to the gas station. So there was a real sense of desperation uh, in the country. Um, and then you had the Levittown riots uh, hmm. where a bunch of truckers started um, a two day <laughs> fracas in a planned community that was sort of a symbol of uh, post-World War II, you know, boom housing. So Carter is summoned back to Washington and plans to give a speech and then disappears um, to Camp David for 10 days. And nobody really knows where he is at first. Uh, he he meets with all kinds of people and comes back to Washington and gives this speech um, where he talks about America's crisis of confidence in some really stark terms. The speech was actually re really well received at first uh, for the first few days, and he never used the term malaise. But, um, but Hamilton Jordan, I uncovered a memo in which he uh, was encouraging Jor uh, Carter to fire the entire cabinet as a show of strength. That was the moment where things really began to backfire. Um, and and since then, that speech became known as the Malays speech. So, Car uh, Kennedy is uh, is re reported to have watched that speech, hmm. and decided that that was when he was going to challenge Carter because he didn't feel like Carter was providing the kind of leadership uh, that the country needed. Um, and if you want, we can get into. How things turned around, I think we'll probably get to that in a moment. Yeah. But it is fascinating just to watch um, the fortunes rise and fall yeah. in the fall of '79. <laughs> yeah, let's get there in just a minute. But but before we do that, John, um, put into perspective, if you would, into historical perspective, the challenge to a sitting president by um, by 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 a challenger by by uh, by by Ted Kennedy in this case. How unique is that in the long flow of American history? How extraordinary a moment was that? Yeah, it's very extraordinary and very rare. Um, and Democrats after that moment, you know, have not um, have not done that. There was talk mm -hmm. of, uh, I believe, Hillary maybe challenging Obama in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and or, I'm sorry, I actually what I'm thinking of is 2008. Even in 2008, the residue of this fight, because you had advisors who worked on this campaign in, in in 80 who were still you know around they were probably junior in 80 and now they're senior advisors in 19 or in 2008 but as the uh the democratic primary between clinton and obama um you remember it was extended and hillary clinton really um, stayed around for a long time the question at the end of that primary was you know does hillary try to really press her advantage to to make a case uh, maybe at the convention for herself. And at the end of the day, her advisors really uh, remembered how painful and um, how harmful it was to the party uh, mm -hmm. to have a sitting president be challenged from within your own party. Um, this wasn't the same situation in 2008, but the level of acrimony and the damage that it done, did to the party, uh, those wounds were still fresh, um, you know, 20, uh, 30 years later. Yeah. yeah. And and you, you write, uh, in such a compelling way in your book about the the personal relationship between these two men in 1980, noting that they really came to to detest each other. And you you say that um, 
they might have been raised on different planets. I, I wonder if you could, Phil, Phil in his introduction yeah. touched on a bit of this, but talk a little bit, of if, if you would, about how their personal backgrounds made these two men uh, so different um, and, and how this might have informed their rivalry. Yeah, I'll back up from this statement, mm. but I do just want to point out that when Carter ran in 76, he was one of the first uh, candidates for president to really run against Washington. He mm -hmm. ran as an outsider. He um, may not be too strong a word to say despised uh, professional Washington, despised sort of the political class uh, here in Washington. And um, and that's been a winning message yeah. uh, pretty much um, almost every election cycle since. Um, but yes, I mean, Phil alluded to it. Jimmy Carter grew up in the deep South on a farm uh, at, before uh, farming tools had really entered the, the modern era. I mean, a lot of the farming tools that his family and their shop, sharecroppers used had been in use for a very, very long time. I, I, I don't remember the exact number of years. It could have been decades. It could have been centuries. I mean, these were uh, really kind of frozen in time places, you know, in rural Georgia. Um, Phil mentioned there was no running water uh, mm -hmm. until he was about 12. They didn't have, you know, toilet paper. Um, uh, so very, very uh, archaic. Um, Carter's dad was not, I wouldn't say he was poor. You know, he had land. Um, he was able to turn a profit with his farm. Um, but they were certainly not wealthy. He had no political political connections. You know, in Carter's path to the state Senate and the governorship are really remarkable. He um, was elected to the state Senate after somehow getting a reporter from Atlanta, I believe from the Journal Constitution, to come out, you know, to West Georgia, to rural Georgia, uh, and investigate these stories of people intimidating voters at the ballot box in the polling place um, and stuffing the ballot box. You know, that was how Carter originally lost his race for the state Senate. And then when he runs for, for governor, uh, he loses the first time, runs as a moderate on race, and then uh, runs a, in between his first and second run for governor, has sort of a spiritual awakening, becomes a born-again Christian. Um, <laughs> and then he runs a second time for governor uh, with a with a message on race that's far more complicated, and you know some have said uh, you know was really appealing to white supremacy down there. And you know I asked Carter about this myself. He said I never did anything to turn off the white supremacists. Mm -hmm. So he acknowledges that that was a factor, and there were certainly things done by people who worked for the Carter campaign in that in that race that were uh, that were not. Uh, that were not right. No. Um, so that's Carter's background. Comes from nothing, has to, you know, claw his way uh, into the politics. Whereas Teddy Kennedy, of course, you know, he's a child living in the ambassadorial residence in London. Uh, you know, just this massive uh, estate in the middle of the city. Um, comes from great wealth and is really pushed into politics. You know, his father um, has to uh, tell him you know, you're not going to go live out in Arizona, which is where he and his uh, first wife, um, Joan, had had talked about. He was not interested in politics, but um, Joe Kennedy said, "You're gonna you're gonna continue the family business," and he sent him uh, up to Massachusetts. Um, so Kennedy, over time, by the time you get to 1980, looks at Carter and sees somebody who's in over his head, and Carter looks at Kennedy and sees somebody who uh, has had a lot of things handed to him. So it's a natural um, natural recipe for mutual loathing. And John, just to push you one step further, how do you see those differences of background play out in the, the animosity between these two figures, you know, as, as the 1980 election approached? Kennedy wants Jimmy Carter to pass a health care law. Um, and Jimmy Carter um, doesn't really make that a priority. 
Um, that's a big policy break. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there is some detente early in Carter's presidency, but the relationship grows colder over time. And by the time you get to 79 and 80, there's not much of a relationship there at all. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time you get to Kennedy kind of inching towards a run, Carter makes it well known uh, you know, he he makes a comment to some members of Congress at a lunch at the White House that he's going to kick Kennedy's ass. Yeah, which is the kind of language that you might not expect from a from a born again Christian, you know, president. Um, even if he did, you know, hang out with Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan. Right. Uh, but uh, but his aides, you know, made sure that the press found out about that comment. And one of the most interesting sort of anecdotes about Jimmy Carter or or details is, you know, Hunter Thompson, who's a, a famous writer, journalist, he, he once called Jimmy Carter one of the three meanest hmm. people he had ever met. Um, and I think the other two were the founder of Hell's Angels and Muhammad Ali. <laughs> right. And what his point was, that this was after Hunter Thompson saw Carter uh, give a speech after Ted Kennedy in Georgia um it's called the law day speech probably carter's second most famous speech yeah, yeah. Um, in which he really kind of took apart not just kennedy but he took apart the uh the political elites the ruling class of georgia uh, in a very populist speech um and carter was willing to be ruthless he really had a had a a, a mean streak in him, even though he came across as gentle, his wife, mm. you know, uh, Rosalind, uh, may she rest in peace, having just passed away. She, um, she once said something to the effect of don't pay attention to that smile. It doesn't mean a thing. Mm -hmm. And how did Ted Kennedy view Jimmy Carter? Would you say? Yeah. I mean, I, I said earlier, he, he thought he was in over his head. Mm -hmm. Um, and that just gets to the fact that Carter came into Washington really, despising the political class. Yeah. He didn't, Carter didn't try to bring in counsel from people who knew, uh, who knew the city, you know, who had yeah. the relationships wired. Um, and so he did spend, that was a mistake. Like he, he spent a good amount of time trying to get up to speed on things that he could have uh, adapted to more quickly if he had drawn on the resources of the people who knew uh, the city. I think that was, yeah. One of Kennedy's mm -hmm. observations. The other was it was just a, a, a difference in style, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that does get to yeah. Kennedy's experience in politics at the national level. I think he understood probably better than Carter did. Um, sort of how to project leadership, yeah. um, and, and and Carter was definitely still learning that on the job. Mm -hmm. Would you go along, I wonder, with the assertion that Ted Kennedy was, in a certain way, the last gasp of great society liberalism? Was that something that was also in play in the rivalry between these two figures? Carter, in other words, despite his hard scrabble background, was in many ways the more conservative figure, whereas Ted Kennedy, arguably through his support for health care and um, his connections, of course, to his, his famous brothers from the 1960s, uh, might stand out as kind of the you know the the person who wore the mantle of that earlier generation of of liberal ambition. Yeah, I don't think you ever saw anybody come along after Ted Kennedy even who mm. really wore that mantle. One of the key things to know about this is you know another part of the the breakup the Democratic coalition was the decline of power of of city bosses and political machines. Mm. Um. I think that does go in hand in hand with sort of uh, the, the type of democratic politics you, you talked about, because um, it wasn't until we all think of the way we elect presidents now as set in stone or not all of us do, but a lot of people do. Um, but we didn't have primaries until the 70s, you know, after the 68 convention. Um, that was when the McGovern, uh, I believe the McGovern Fraser Commission uh, took place and they instituted primaries. Primaries was a big part of how Carter won the nomination mm -hmm. in 76. And that was taking power out of the hands of party elites and transferring it to the grassroots. And, you know, I actually think that 
primaries now have been weaponized and are one of the greatest things damaging uh, American politics. We have, you know, 10 percent of the uh, of the voters choosing 80 um, percent of our Congress, mm -hmm. uh, choosing who hundreds of millions of us get to choose from for president. Uh, but at the time, um, you know, the primary system was uh, designed by reformers yeah. um, to to get to, to kind of take party away from that party elite. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, and you mentioned a few minutes ago that early polling in the the race for the Democratic nomination had Ted Kennedy way out in front, and yet Jimmy Carter closed that gap, obviously, and and came out on top in the end. Explain that part of the the rise and fall of Ted Kennedy's fortunes. I guess the fall part. How how was it that Kennedy, that uh, Jimmy Carter was able to make the comeback and and ultimately prevail? So a lot of people remember, why do you want to be president? The question mm -hmm. from Roger Mudd that Ted Kennedy uh, had trouble answering. Um, that interview took place a few days before Kennedy's announcement for president. Um, I believe, I didn't check this detail, it's been a few years since I wrote this book, but I believe that the Mudd interview aired on a Sunday, the same day that uh, the uh, hostages were taken at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Tehran. So that happens uh, right before Kennedy announces. Mm -hmm. The Mudd interview, uh, there's a whole chapter in my book on that interview, um, just a fast, you know, just a really interesting episode. Um, the Mudd interview raises a lot of doubts and questions in the minds of political elites uh, about Kennedy's pre preparedness for for this campaign. The What's hostage, the yeah, go ahead. Sorry, John, go please. Uh, the hostage crisis at the same time creates a rally around the leader dynamic in the larger country. And it pushes Kennedy out of the news cycle, which at that time is, you know, three TV stations and um, a couple major newspapers uh, nationally and in, in, in each city. Um, and it makes it pretty hard for Kennedy to criticize Carter as he's yeah. launching his campaign. So all of these things contribute to a freeze out. Carter's poll numbers turn upside down within the span of a few weeks. And then you've got Iowa. The Iowa caucuses are, are upon them in, in uh, the new year. And so uh, Kennedy loses Iowa and loses New Hampshire. And um, from that point on, it's an uphill battle. He does, you know, make a an effort and, and gain some momentum after that. But that two month period between his announcement and the New Hampshire primary are really critical for what happens next. And John, that that mud interview, as you point out, is, it seems to me to be so important in the changing perception of of Ted Kennedy. What's your explanation for how poorly Ted Kennedy did in that particular moment? Um, you know, it, it, it's sometimes been suggested. I think you you mentioned this in your book that there was a sense of entitlement there on Ted Kennedy's part, maybe even an uncertainty about whether he really wanted this. Uh, you know, run for the presidency that was a, a, a matter of kind of the momentum of being a Kennedy. It was almost an expectation that maybe he uh, had had his own personal misgivings about. Anyway, I, what, what's your what's your, what's your explanation? Yeah, you know, Mark. After I really spent a lot of time with this story, it did look to me like Teddy was was pulled and pushed into this race mm -hmm. by events. And by advisors and by history uh, and his family name. I did not, I, I think at a certain point, once he was losing, he became a, more of a, a participant, a willing participant. And I don't quite understand the psychology mm -hmm. there. Maybe it was, you know, losing that kind of was the cold water that woke him up. Yeah. But there was this sort of glaze over you know this glazed look mm -hmm. that he had for much of the mud interview that i think people caught on ca caught on to and yeah. it really did raise this question of you know why why do you want to be yeah. do you want to be president <laughs> um because there had been 
election cycle after election cycle. I mean, he almost ran in uh, 68, um, I believe. Uh, yeah, 68. Sorry, I mentioned earlier yeah. that Bobby was killed in 69, but 68. Um, he almost ran that year. Um, and every year after that, you know, it, but it was the same question over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, we'll get to this probably later, but um, yeah. there was so much pressure on him to to do this at some point. Yeah. And um, and I think it, I think he was happy to have it over and done with once it was all yeah. Yeah. finished. Let me ask you what I'm sure is an unfair counterfactual, but um, these are the things that make history fun. Um, could... Ted Kennedy, if he had performed more effectively, yeah. have gotten the nomination in 1980? Yeah, I mean, these are hard questions to answer. <laughs> um, he didn't have uh, a couple things that were hanging around Carter's neck, namely the the hostage crisis. Uh -huh. um, you know, even if, if the hostage crisis had lasted until mm -hmm. election day like it did, uh, you know, that wasn't Kennedy's Carter. Kennedy wasn't president, so he wasn't, you know, totally responsible for that. Hmm. Um, he also had a pretty different leadership style. I think he would have been a better debater just to present on presentation. You know, a lot of Reagan's appeal was, you know, he had a he was a, he was a former actor. Uh, he was able to present well on television and, and Carter was earnest and sincere and authentic and that stuff doesn't necessarily come through mm. on television. Yeah. Uh, Kennedy, as we talked about earlier, I think understood how to project leadership. Um, so we, it, it's possible, but I think Kennedy would have would have had some real problems answering mm. questions about Chappaquiddick. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of you know other questions about his marriage and his um, personal life. So that that would have been an issue for sure. And I suppose another undoubtedly unfair counterfactual is could candidate Kennedy, the Democratic Party nominee, have performed better against Ronald Reagan? Can I run that one by you and see if see what you think? Um, I thought that was the question I just answered. Whether well, I, I'm drawing, I suppose, a, a fine distinction here in yeah. the first place. Could a different uh, uh, Kennedy? Could a different performance by Ted Kennedy have resulted in the Democratic nomination? Uh, and then secondarily, oh, you were could, me if could you a could candidate beaten Carter? But yeah, it's a it's a fine distinction. <laughs> I mean, going back to the Democratic nomination, I just think once once you have what happened, the the, the hostages. Uh, and the mud interview, mm. um, you know, and once you lose Iowa and New Hampshire, it's yeah. it's pretty tough from there. But the other thing yeah. that really stood out to me was you go to the convention, and and there is a push actually to try to to get Kennedy to replace Carter, mm -hmm. um, which gains a little bit of steam because of yeah. you know Jimmy Carter's brother Billy uh, and yeah. a scandal he was involved with with uh, Libya. Uh, before the convention. But even though there's a push for that for Kennedy at the convention, there's also a significant portion of the Democratic uh, Party hmm. that's not really interested, even if they are not enthused about Carter, they, they are not super interested in, in, in Kennedy yeah. either. There's a push for uh, a senator from Maine, um, who uh, who's who went on to negotiate the 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 peace agreement in Ireland? Whose name is escaping me at the at the moment, but um, Musky. you know there are people like him who are being nominated mm -hmm. as an alternative to Kennedy. Yeah, uh, yep. and I think that goes to some of the discomfort with his with his personal life. Yeah, yeah. Now your your book, as as we've acknowledged, is principally about the demo, the, the struggle on the Democratic side. But let me just ask you a little bit about Ronald Reagan, um, an unavoidable figure um, in in connection with 1980. Um, he himself was perhaps not as clear eyed, as consistent as we sometimes might think in retrospect. Right, Reagan is sort of etched in marble in many ways. It seems to me in the way that many people talk about him. But if we 
put ourselves back in 1980, we see a Ronald Reagan who's also struggling to define exactly where he stands in the in the spectrum of opinion on the GOP side of the story. He surrounded himself famously, I think, with a, a wide array of advisors and even considered Gerald Ford as his running mate in, in 1980, something that certainly cut against the sort of conservative credentials that um, that he would come to be known for um, over the course of his presidency. At any rate, how would you describe Ronald Reagan's position within his his own party and the the, the ways in which his, Americans uh, perceptions of Reagan evolved as the campaign advanced? Well, I mean, you mentioned the Ford co-presidency. That's uh, going back and watching that footage was um was eye-opening mm -hmm. uh, and it showed you know um a level of uncertainty and indecision by reagan uh, who ultimately ended up going with uh george hw bush to try to um to win over the evangelicals you know back in 76 reagan was the renegade the upstart um talking about you know smaller government taking on the establishment mm -hmm. so um, he, you know, he did grow into this, uh, larger than life, um, Kennedy-esque figure for yeah. the Republican party. Um, but, uh, at the beginning, um, he was really, you know, as you said, uncertain, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and quite kind of undefined in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you kind of, your mention of his, his advisor speaks to his malleability. He was mm -hmm. sort of looking for a persona, which, you know, he, he was helped by the fact that the economy sort of turned around in his first term. Um, and he was also helped by the fact that the Democrats were, were adrift after a painful, um, you know, fight between Kennedy and Carter. Um, and and also adrift in terms of their their electorate, you know, they had lost the South to Reagan, um, as uh, everything I outlined in the beginning about their connection with the working class, all of that yeah. was um, was 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 kind of splitting apart, and they were changing. They were becoming a very special interest focused activist focused mm -hmm. party, and it took until Clinton um, to kind of patch it back together. Um, so Reagan benefited from all that, um, I think. Yeah. And the result, of course, was something we can easily call a a, a landslide. Um, Reagan wins by a huge margin. Did the Carter camp see that coming, or at least the, the full scale of that uh, landslide? Talk about how they understood their chances as the election drew close. Uh, they thought it was close. I mean, Pat Cadell was was Carter's bolster. Um, he passed a few years ago, was a larger than life character. Um, and I think it was the last rally of the campaign. Uh, they were still um, looking at numbers, seeing numbers that mm. showed them within victory. Yeah. And I think it was that last weekend that they, according to their telling, saw the poll numbers start to go the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, they blamed it on the TV network's, you know, uh, focus on the one year anniversary of the hostages being taken. Yeah. Um, so that's their telling of the story. Um, but, you know, it was competitive. It was competitive. There, that's, that's not debatable mm -hmm. um, uh, for most, much of the election, <laughs> but it yeah. certainly wasn't competitive on election day. And turning back to Ted Kennedy for a second, you suggest, I think, a really fascinating part of the book toward the end, that Ted Kennedy's loss was, in a certain sense, good for Ted Kennedy, who gave up finally on the presidency um, and devoted himself to the Senate, where he achieved you know, genuine distinction. Um, talk a little bit about how that experience of running unsuccessfully in 1980 shaped Ted Kennedy's expectations and his career thereafter. Yeah, I I think it was painful to lose the election. Uh, you know, he certainly did fight for a very long time. Um, I have kind of wondered whether that was him 
wanting to wring every last drop out of this one shot so that he didn't have to do it again. Mm. Uh, because when he was done and, you know, that monkey was off his back, yeah. uh, you know, if he runs a campaign and kind of loses Iowa and New Hampshire and then drops out, um, I can see a scenario where later on in, in 84, mm-hmm. Democrats are saying, well, you know, maybe this time. Yeah. Kennedy. But if you really go the whole way yeah. and you burn, yeah. you burn the bridges, you know, yeah. uh, there's a finality to that, that I think, um, again, speaks to where Kennedy's head was at. Mm. Um, and he does, he goes on. Uh, I think the, the Reagan presidency was a good foil mm-hmm. for Kennedy, even though Kennedy, you know, he worked with Reagan on some things. Um, but you know, the Bork and um, and Thomas hearings are, are big moments for him to become a hero to the activists. But he also does a lot of just um, very, I don't want to say, I, I was going to say pedestrian yeah. legislating. I don't know if that's the right adjective, but mm. it's it's workmanlike. You know, I think it, I think it was Kennedy who talked about three yards and a cloud of dust. You know, yeah. that's how you get laws passed through dogged, uh, relentless effort uh, year yeah. after year after year. And, you know, he, he is somebody who, if there are people, and there are in Congress who wanted to be legislators, mm. because many in Congress don't want to be legislators, they want to be TV stars. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, going back to the primary system, a big reason why. Um, But anybody who wanted to learn how to legislate, you know, would would learn a lot by studying Ted Kennedy's career. And a lot of that growth comes after this this experience. Mm -hmm. John, let me ask you um, about your attitude as an author who spent a lot of time digging into the lives of Ted Kennedy and Jimmy Carter and to a much lesser extent, Ronald Reagan, for that matter. Where do you, where do you stand on these figures? You know, a few years out from your book, who, who do you sympathize with most, uh, with the passage Uh, of time? Well, sympathize is an interesting word. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I sympathize more with Kennedy Mm -hmm. and I look up to Jimmy Carter Um, I look up to Kennedy too, but he's more of a tragic figure. Um, I do admire his, uh, fortitude Mm -hmm. in this election. Um, you know, I think he, he shows some, some real sort of backbone and, uh, what's the word? I don't know. He, he, he really does show some, some character Mm -hmm. and, um, even though I'm sure a lot of Carter people would, would not like that <laughs> characterization um, in sort of persi- persisting in his speech at the convention, you know, the dream will never die. It's, yeah. it kind of carries mm. so much weight because of that. I think, um, I, I think it remains one of the great kind of moments in American rhetoric. Yeah. Um, and Carter is somebody I've come to really look up to. Mm-hmm. Um, as I mentioned, I was raised evangelical. Yeah. Uh, I've written a book about that whole uh, journey. Mm-hmm. And I really do see Carter as somebody who, more than anyone in my lifetime, more than any president I can think of or, or know of, who tried to really not bring faith into the presidency in a way that was oppressive or beating people over the head. Mm. tried to live out his Christian faith in public life with a level of nuance and complexity and selflessness yeah. that um, that I find to be really compelling and integrity. I mean, the guy has, no one can question his integrity. Mm. Uh, and just the way he's conducted himself as an ex-president, I find inspirational. Um, not just the the philanthropy, and the alleviation of disease and suffering and the election monitoring, uh, but also the modesty and the simplicity. I just find it incredibly inspiring. Mm 
Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. And by the way, let me pause just for a moment and invite members of our virtual audience to please put your questions into the Q and A or the chat uh, function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And John, I'll just uh, ask you a couple more quick ones um, before I turn things over to uh, Sandy Cress and and the Q and A part of our program. You mentioned close to the beginning of the book that there are some striking similarities between the 1980 race and our own political movement, and especially the 2016 election, which was, you know, I suppose the freshest political, uh, fre the freshest presidential election when you uh, were working on, on this book. What are the, the similarities that you would point to between 1980 and, and our own moment? Well, uh, when I started the book, it was just after Obama had been reelected. Mm hmm by the time I finished it, um, former President Trump was, um, you know, ascendant, I would say, in the party. Um, it was published in 19, but I was largely done, I don't know, sometime in 16, 17, maybe 18. Um, so there was just a, uh, a darkness, a despair in our, in our political discussion uh, by the time I finished the book that seemed similar to some of the ways I heard and saw people talking about the seventies mm -hmm. uh, in, in a way I hadn't experienced uh, before that. And then I think, uh, you know, a big similarity, uh, another similarity of it that's of interest is, you know, in 2016 at the Republican convention, uh, you actually did have a pretty robust effort to try to uh, switch nominees. You know, I stood, I was on the floor of the convention in 16 in Cleveland. And I was standing three feet away from Senator Mike Lee uh, of Utah, who uh, people may have forgotten this. He was leading the effort to try to replace Trump um, on the, as the nominee. And I was standing a few feet away from him when he was uh, yelling out his objection um, to a procedural vote that was basically going to quash that rebellion um you know that's that was the first time you really had that at a convention since 1980 with the democrats um if you look at today i think one of the big similarities is inflation hmm. uh you know carter uh battled that during his presidency it, it was it was one of the big reasons he lost and you know uh president biden has been uh battling this um it's a big reason why even though the economy has you know has turned around a lot from last year there's still a lot of pessimistic consumer sentiment mm -hmm. consumer sentiment often trails um you know statistical data and, and and we get that but um you know the economy is always huge in how presidential elections go and um yeah. i would say that's one of the big big similarities now. Are there any lessons from the 1980 race that you think either party would do well to, to bear in mind well, in 2024? I mean, the most obvious one is that you don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, if you're, if you're Ted Kennedy in, in the fall of 79, or if you're, if you're mm -hmm. one of his advisors, you're thinking, you're thinking ahead to the general election. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, so you might think you're going to be the nominee. Um, and you don't know what's going to happen. So that's that's a big lesson in politics yeah. in general. But the the seven the eighty uh, primary is is a stark example of that. Well, John Ward, I want to thank you very sincerely for spending time with me this afternoon, and congratulations again on Camelot's End, the Democrats' last great civil war, a book I highly recommend to all of our listeners. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank and you for let, having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. And let me now turn things over to my friend and colleague, Sandy Kress, who will pose some additional questions. Thank you, Mark. Uh, John, so good to be with you. I have been looking forward to this interview for several reasons. One, just it's a fascinating topic for all people interested in political science or history. But personally, I was uh, in the Carter administration uh, and uh, a fan of Ted Kennedy. In fact, I negotiated No Child Left Behind for President Bush 43 uh, with uh, with Ted Kennedy and and uh, grew to uh, 
know him and admire him a great deal. So your take on these issues is something I've been looking forward to a great deal. Uh, glad to have this chance to ask you a few questions. Great. Thank you. I want to focus first because this is uh, this is part of so many different questions in your interview so far with Mark. I don't know that I've ever seen a president who had such fluctuation in the polls as Jimmy Carter did during that 18 month to two year period, twice in the high 50s and twice in the 20s. Um, I guess I want to ask you generally, but let me round, let me surround it with a question. Uh, what, how much uh, the answers to all of this depend upon uh, those that that up and down? You know, I've had uh, there's an anonymous question, and Mike Pristorius asks a question around the hostage crisis. Hmm. What uh, what role did the hostage crisis play in the election? Mike asking what was the role specifically of the failed rescue mission? Uh, and I guess I, as I look at these polls, I've just got them right here in front of me. Right after Kennedy announces, there is this, and you've talked about it, this real nice rise in Carter's popularity out of sympathy, I guess, for the president rallying around the flag. And yeah. then this deep decline that takes place, largely beginning with the failed crisis. Uh, that made a big difference, didn't it? Both of those events. Yeah, um, the uh, the hostage crisis, and then followed by what again? By the failed uh, rescue mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the failed rescue mission. I think was April. Um, I want to say, and that did uh, certainly, you know, I think play a role in Kennedy's campaign gaining some momentum. Um, you know. I think it's also probably a big reason why things went to the convention. Um, you mentioned Carter's numbers going up and down. I'm, I'm looking at the Gallup numbers right now. Um, you know, the Camp David Accords were a big reason why he had that second spike. Yeah. Um, and, um, and the economy was kind of driving things down and down and down. And then Camp David happens, pops back up. And then the economy just keeps pulling him back down, which goes to my point at the end against with Mark. It's 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 often the economy that is sort of the baseline. And if you have something really big that happens, um, you know, that can move things a different direction. Um, you know, foreign policy today, I don't it doesn't seem to drive numbers in a similar way. Um, but, you know, if we were to have major conflict that involved our own military, I think that would that would move the needle for sure. Yeah, exactly. I think you're right. But that was such a unique situation where it was embarrassing. I mean, deeply embarrassing to the country. And then this failed mission, which I think was, uh, as Mike is suggesting in his question, very troubling. Uh, so uh, that fall that began, it was almost a steady fall, although Carter steadied things um, and this leads me to my next question. As you suggest, he he actually was leading Reagan uh, in the polls before the debates. I think he was eight points ahead. So even with these problems, he pulled himself uh, out and pulled it into a lead. Uh, and as you say, he was in the polls showed he was a few points ahead among uh, among uh, uh, uh likely voters, and even more among registered voters uh, the weekend before the election. Um, I guess I want to use those facts to ask you this question. Given uh, Carter's being competitive and even mm -hmm. being ahead yeah. uh, toward the end, does that suggest that perhaps this fight did not break the Democratic Party? that um, he was still competitive, still possibly able to win even after this intra-party fight, uh, and that maybe it were all, it was all these other things that caused his defeat. Um, instead of what? Instead of being hurt by the intra-party fight. I guess uh, I'm asking how much was he how yeah. much was he hurt by the intra-party fight? as opposed to inflation, as opposed to the 
failed rescue mission as opposed to Reagan's competitive strengths and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the Kennedy challenge, you know, there's no question that it, that it hurt him. Um, when you try to kind of weigh up, when you try to look at the scale and say, what's the what's the the thing that that went on the scale that tipped it at the you know into a loss, that's really hard to do. Um, but th there's it's probably not arguable to say oh you know he would have been better off um or he, he he was he was made stronger by the kennedy challenge um you know i i just think there's no question that it, that it weakened him in particular what happened at the convention i mean the night of his acceptance speech um is just an utter humiliation in front of the entire country and what should have been a moment of victory and strength um, becomes a moment of embarrassment and humiliation. So, um, you know, the hostages probably and the economy and inflation are probably more consequential, but the Kennedy challenge uh, uh, really played up the idea that he was weak and that that was not helpful. Well, I certainly I was there at that convention and it was it was embarrassing to be sure. And it you're absolutely right. It was of no help <laughs> to have had the challenge. But how much hurt he was by it, I guess, is what I was driving at. Uh, I, you know, I was active in that campaign and I I remember it just seemed to me that most people who were campaigning for him felt that um but it it didn't it didn't it didn't hurt him as much I think as as it as it might be supposed. It was embarrassing, but I think it was as embarrassing for Kennedy as it was hurtful to Carter. In any mm -hmm. event, let me let me go on to the next question. I'm just stunned at how far off that final poll was. Ten point a ten point loss, as opposed to being a few points ahead. Uh, that seems to be about as much as Gallup was ever off that I'm familiar with. Uh, and the do you have any do you have any sense? In, uh, you talked about this a little bit with Mark, but I want you to focus a little bit on why do you think uh, uh, th it was that far off? I don't don't have a strong opinion on that. I mean, I haven't looked at these polling numbers anytime recently. Um, the only real tangible thing I can remember Pat Cadell and Carter's advisor saying was they felt like the the network, you know, focus on the, the year anniversary of the hostage crisis was a big reason why uh, the numbers kind of the basement or the floor fell out. Um, yeah. I remember Cadell talking about that uh, you know, at this last rally somewhere out West, I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, is that why, I don't know, it seems plausible, but, um, yeah. but it's also possible that the pollsters missed something. We've certainly seen plenty of that in the last few years. Yeah. I was just curious if you had a take on it, that, that sounded more like a pollster, uh, you know, a thought of an insider who, who was saying it was going to be close and it wasn't, but, be that as it may. I want to talk to you a little bit, ask you a little bit about the Reagan campaign. Um, the uh, I was interested during that year uh, at how far he went, John Sears did this with him and some others did, to try to make him look more moderate. Because uh, I recall that being a real concern that he was perceived as an extremist. Uh, and he went out of his way to show himself to be an environment, to be uh, pro environmentalism. I remember there was a week where that was his focus. He went to the Urban League and gave a speech on uh, how pro civil rights he was. Uh, to what extent did those efforts uh, help Reagan become more competitive in the election? Yeah, I think they helped. Um, I think the debate, though, was probably a bigger factor. But, you know, all of those efforts to kind of chip away at a candidate's weakness play play a role. Um, 
I think when people were actually able to see him next to Carter, um, that was pretty late in the campaign, as I remember. And that, uh, that I think moved the numbers. I think that was part of Reagan kind of reassuring people that he wasn't, um, at least people who voted for him, you know, he was able to convince a lot of people that he was not, uh, what his critics said he was, whether that was, um, you know, a warmonger or whether that was, you know, not serious. Um, you know, that debate was, was a big deal. Um, you know, there you go again was a big line. Um, but Carter didn't help himself either. You know, he got a lot of criticism for, um, the way he talked about his decision, whether or not to use nuclear weapons and having discussed it with his, um, young daughter at the time, Amy, um, you know, all that stuff, but, you know, Reagan's Reagan's, I think also was effective in that other famous line, which is, you know, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Yeah. Um, and that, that really tapped into all of the economic troubles, inflation, uh, energy, it tapped into, um, the 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 sense of i don't know vulnerability maybe that that was uh taking place because of the hostage crisis what role did do you think uh john anderson made played in this in the election did did he uh, turn votes one way or the other i realized it ended up being such a big victory it 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 couldn't have been that much either way but what role did he play yeah, you, you surprised me with that one. I had a strong opinion about this when the book came out, and now I'm trying to remember what it was. <laughs> um, he's a fascinating guy. Um, you know, his whole uh, arc as a person and as a politician. Um, but I, I believe uh, when I was deep in the in this material that I felt like the Anderson candidacy did not play a major role. That was That's what I remember thinking and saying at the time but i'm a little rusty on that one yeah it yeah i just was it, you know whenever you have a third party candidate who gets yeah. any votes more than a percent or two and he got right. almost seven you'd think uh could this have made made a difference um i want you to return to i just can't get it out of my system because i remember watching the roger mudd interview and i know mark visited with you about that but I want to ask you whether you think there might be another possible explanation of it, because I certainly thought at the time that it was exactly what you said. Um, but, you know, Kennedy did come on after that, giving very strong speeches, um, you know, and I think he showed that he, at least to me, that he really wanted it. I mean, he was powerful, strong, tough. He gave good speeches, gave a great speech at the convention. Um, one person in the Wall Street Journal just a few weeks ago uh, uh, talking about CBS and they were going after the way CBS had treated Nikki Haley using the same issue. Uh, a fellow raised the possibility that CBS had held this interview for a while uh, and that uh, they pushed it out there at a time when Kennedy was, that it was done, I'm sorry, that the interview was not, was done way ahead of the uh, announcement and that it surprised Kennedy a little bit. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I want to ask you about it. And I want to ask you whether it's possible that he just wasn't prepared, uh, that he wasn't prepared and politicians have to be prepared, even Ted Kennedy. Uh, that it may have just been not being prepared for that question. Do either of those make any sense? Well, this I can talk about. I mean, I, I, I love this whole story because um, it's taken on, you know, the whole after report, the after action report on, on how this interview came about. Uh, you know, it took on the, the, the tenor of a Senate investigation, you know, with, the Kennedy camp putting out their version and yeah. Mud putting out his version. Uh, Mud, you know, has probably a, at least a whole chapter in his memoir about this. Um, whether or not he was prepared, um, you know, one detail signals to me he was not taking it seriously enough. That is, 
most people don't know this. The mud interview actually took place in two installments. The first installment, two interviews. The two, the first interview was up on Cape Cod. Uh, the second interview was at his Senate office in Washington. And at that first interview on Cape Cod, there were no staff present. Um, that to me signals that Kennedy was uh, was expecting a softer interview. Yeah. And and he afterwards, Kennedy, you know, told, said publicly that he had been told by Mudd that it would be a soft interview. Mudd said, no, that's not true. Um, but, you know, the idea that you would have an interview with a major network correspondent without uh, an aide present is unthinkable uh, now and, and was then, I think, also. Now, as far as CBS and whether they held it, my recollection and again, you can go check this in Mudd's memoir and 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 in Kennedy in some of the literature about Kennedy. But my recollection is that um, the interview in in the Cape went horribly, um, and, and that's you know the question about why do you want to be president was the second interview. The first interview was in Cape Cod. It was all about Chappaquiddick. I mean, to me, that's really what is the the striking thing about the Mudd interview, which, by the way, was an hour long special. Um, this was an hour long special, not just interview, but mud kind of going through every detail of what happened in Chappaquiddick in 69. And Kennedy's performance with those questions was atrocious. And so, um, you know, that first interview happens, there's no aid present. Uh, and so Kennedy, I believe, asks for a second interview to do, to get a do over, um, and I, and I think according to Mudd's telling, um, they're, you know, working on getting the package ready. Maybe there was some stuff going on at, at CBS with executives. There's a whole side story about Mudd trying to get, you know, the, the main anchor job um, uh, after uh, forgetting his name. I, should, I, can't, I can't remember. I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. But um, Mudd's story is that they're they're getting ready to to put it to air, and then Kennedy sort of tries to move up his announcement so that they can't air it without giving Kennedy sort of uh, sort of fair use, I think, or fair reply. Anyway, it had some impact on how they could air it according to FEC laws, I think. And so CBS kind of like moved a bunch of things around to air it before the Kennedy announcement. So that's yeah. my right. Wow, that's so fascinating. And isn't it amazing, as you suggested a moment ago, and it turns out you, you were absolutely right, that interview takes place the very day our hostages are taken yeah. in Iran. You were, you were absolutely right about that, which leads me, and I know this is a counterfactual question to ask, but Kennedy, for Kennedy to decide to run as much as he wanted to run, being 20 points ahead or whatever it was, had he had that, had it been two or three weeks later, as Carter's making this rise yeah, yeah. in the polls, would Kennedy, do you think Kennedy would have run if it were five points or close or Carter ahead? Yeah, I think if the hostages are taken a month before yeah. they were, I do think that that's a that's a that's a strong likelihood that he doesn't pull the trigger at that point. Yeah. Don't you? It's fascinating, yeah. isn't it, that those two things happen the same same day. It's funny how history works. Yeah, it Final, is weird. Yeah. It, it is totally weird. Final question. I'm just I've learned a lot from you on a lot of things, and especially this idea of the two sides of Jimmy Carter, which I did not know as much as I, mean, I worked. I was in his campaign. I worked for him. I did not know as much about that other side. But um, it certainly explains, doesn't it? I, I just was surprised to see uh, him hitting uh, Kennedy hard uh, after Kennedy died on this issue of the health bill. Uh, hmm. However much he may have felt about it, that seemed to be, did that surprise you that that he came and hit him that hard uh, on that on that? I mean, I actually I know a little bit about what was going on politically between the two, but that seemed to be kind of a low blow. Did you, did you have a take on that? I'm not familiar with that. Was that uh, around President Obama's health care law? No, 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 I'm sorry. When uh, Carter, 
uh, and I think you you may have mentioned this, but uh, when when Ken Kennedy passes away, yeah. Carter's interviewed about it, and Carter <laughs> criticizes Kennedy for not not negotiating with him taking his legislation seriously and actually suggests that he would have passed his health initiative had Kennedy been supportive instead of resistant uh, uh, among the various chairs in the health committees back during the time he was president. I, yeah, I mean, it just, it goes to one of, Ken, one of Carter's weaknesses. Um, you know, he, he, he held a grudge I think for the 80 campaign. Um, and he could be, he could be exacting. He could be sort of censorious. I think he's probably harder on himself than anyone else than, than he is on anyone else. But, you know, I think that that's a common characteristic is when people are really hard on themselves and really driven, they can, they can take that same thing out on, on other people. Uh, but, you know, he did have a bit of the, I don't know, the fair, I don't want to say Pharisee, that's not quite right. But yeah, he just, he couldn't bite his tongue at times when it came to saying what he thought. He never wanted to really play politics, even as president. You know, he wanted to say what he thought was right and persuade people that way. And, you know, he he uh, continued that way. I think what you were seeing primarily, though, is just sort of his resentment of Kennedy's um, challenge in 80. I, I saw that too when I spoke to him. Yeah, even after uh, publicly and even after Senator Kennedy had just passed away. Yeah. Listen, I've learned so much from you and I'm grateful. I know our audience is so grateful for having this opportunity to learn about this election and to learn about uh, significantly about President Carter. John, thank you so much. I'm going to turn this now back to Phil Barnes. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, John Ward for a very special afternoon. It's a splendid book, and I commend it to our audience. And thank you, Mark and Sandy, as well. Today's program brings to a close the third year of this series on the American presidency. During 18 programs over three years, we have had conversations with historians and journalists about 14 of our 46 presidents. These conversations have given us new insights into some of the iconic figures in our history, and also insights to some of the presidents who might not have been as well known. The conversations took us through the challenging and difficult decisions that presidents made for peace and war. And we were made to feel, as we were today, a part of certain consequential and pivotal elections. For those of us interested in American politics, this series has been very special. Mark Lawrence and Sarah McCracken and Sandy Kress had served as her hosts for these programs throughout the three-year period. And Russ Hall, behind the scenes, is the technical communication specialist supporting each of the webinars. But I want to expect, extend a special thank you to Mark Lawrence. This series was possible only because of his efforts his thoughtful planning of each year's theme, his ability to reach and successfully invite world-renowned historians and journalists as our special guests, and then his engaging interviews of each of them. And I would remind our audience that Dr. Lawrence does all of this while he has a full-time job running the nation's premier presidential libraries. And in addition to this, please note that Mark Lawrence and his colleague, Mark Updegrove, the president of the LBJ Foundation, will be leading a special six-week seminar on the years of Lyndon B. Johnson. It begins on Monday, 
September the 30th. It runs each Monday through November 4 in 2024. And that Monday on November 24 is the day before Election Day. It should be a fascinating program. It's offered as a part of the UT Olive Sage curriculum for next fall. The seminar will be held in the LBJ Auditorium on campus, and all members of UT Olive, friends of the LBJ Library, and of Humanities Texas are invited to attend. It will be a unique opportunity to learn more about LBJ's life and legacy from two of the nation's eminent presidential scholars. I hope you will attend. And thank all of you for joining us each week. After all, this series was planned with you in mind. And I hope you've enjoyed the programs as much as we have enjoyed bringing them to you. Thank you again, and goodbye, at least for now.